just a few weeks ago and asked if I would do this. And I thought, sure, why not? And I actually have had very little time to put it together, but that's right. So it's not going to have all the pictures that I would like to put into this PowerPoint. But c'est la vie. You didn't want to see a picture of mine. It sounds like my two sisters growing up anyways. <laughs> um, and I wasn't at all worried about doing this presentation until I got emails this morning from the people who couldn't attend saying, it's so courageous of you. What have I got myself into? Anyways, when Andrea first asked about doing something different, it occurred to me that I don't know much about most of my colleagues who are not CMPS colleagues. So what I had hoped this would be is a chance to kind of situate myself personally, so you get to know a little bit about me because who I am and where I came from very much informs the kind of work that I've been doing. So, let me start. My clinical and research interests, for as long as I can remember, have been in the areas of women's sexuality and reproductive health, and developmental transitions in adult life, which is very consistent with the counseling psychology perspective, because we're all about how do you facilitate um, change and growth across the lifespan uh, with basic issues that people face, the stuff that we all kind of bump up against. And for me, the role of sexuality and reproductive health comes out of a few places. Let me start by giving you my personal history. Yeah, the last hand here. All right. I come from a working class Catholic family, and I think that that certainly has informed things like why I'm studying women's sexuality. Um, Windsor, Ontario, auto workers, very basic kind of family. But the more important of those factors, um, my father immigrated from the Ukraine when he was only six years old. The whole importance of education, my grandparents' emphasis on how important education was, really was very instrumental in terms of my own journey. I was the youngest of three girls, and that was important because if I had brothers, the gender differentials in terms of what we all did would have been very clearly delineated. There would have been blue jobs and pink jobs. But when you have three girls, much to my mother's dismay, in fact, when I was born, being the third, when she came out of whatever kind of uh, sedation she was in, her first words were, not another stinking girl. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought, okay, Mom, well, I'm going to prove to you that this was a good thing. What was also important about that is that there were no things that we weren't taught to do. And in fact, when I left home, my father gave me a, a basically a portable tool case that you could stick in your purse. So I always had a Phillips screwdriver, and I had all of these things, which I actually knew the names of, which people were quite amazed at. You know, can you give me a Robertson? Yeah, sure, no problem. Really? Uh, and, and so I didn't see that there should be any kind of limitations in terms of what I do. So let me tell you about my early career history. In childhood, I was destined to do this kind of work, because my favorite thing to do was play in school. Interesting part is I would never be a pupil, I would only be the teacher, and I would line up all the kids in the neighborhood, and if they didn't do what I told them to do, I'd send them home. <laughs> my mother still laughs about that. So I think I was destined for something in education. In adolescence, I had numerous jobs in the service and had hospitality industry. I was the first woman car checker on the Canadian National Railway. And a car checker is someone who's out in the field, who checks the numbers of the cars as they go by, who drives the conductors to the trains and does all of that. It was probably one of the most sexist environments I could ever have been in. And that was probably one of my real first um, experiences of blatant sexism. Um, so that was important. Bartending was also really important. It was one of my favorite jobs. And I learned that I would have a whole bar full of people who wanted to talk. I should have known at that point that counseling was where I belonged because I did an awful lot of counseling when I was working. So you learn these things as you go along. Early adulthood, I worked for Planned Parenthood, Calvary Birth Control Association. That whole issue back in the 70s, crisis pregnancy counseling, birth control was just coming out. Feminism was just really starting to, thank heavens for feminism, starting to, to become very prevalent. And they were really important influences in terms of what I eventually ended up doing. Um, in terms of my clinical work, and I, and I truly like counseling psychology, we are practitioners, scientists. I am a clinician at heart, and so much of the work that I do is to inform clinical practice. Um, 
Back in the 1980s, I worked for the California Regional Fertility Center. It was one of the first people to do IVF counseling. Uh, bumped up against some sexism there as well because the dean of the uh, medical school, when they asked me if I could actually start working there on site, he gave me a story about how there was a psychologist married to a psychiatrist and they both called themselves doctors. And no, we couldn't have a psychologist working in the center because then the patients would never know whether they were seeing the real doctor or not. <laughs> Very interesting in terms of dealing with the medical system. My work has been interdisciplinary. I have had to deal with the medical system for many years in terms of negotiating that. And I'm, I'm painfully aware of the fact that as psychologists, we are down below the docs, the medical docs. Um, interesting stuff. I did general infertility counseling. I then did some private practice in reproductive health, eating disorders, that sort of thing. Um, went on in the 1990s um, and through 2010, consulting to Genesis Fertility Center. Um, counseling went from the IVF to third party reproduction. So uh, my clinical work, once I got tenure, I went back and did this kind of work again. And I would deal with people coming through doing uh, one day a week. I would see them every couple of weeks. Um, if they were doing donor egg, donor sperm, gestational surrogacy, they would come and spend an hour with me or two, depending, and we'd talk through the implications of what they were doing. Um, so very interesting, very interesting work. I consulted to Health Canada and Assisted Human Reproduction Canada and was part of the Canadian AHR Assisted Human Reproduction Counseling Guidelines, which have been accepted by the uh, Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society. In terms of my research history, my master's research, so interesting when I think about the times. This was back in, my, in the early 80s. And basically what I did is I developed a program called Children Yes or No, which was a decision-making program for women trying to decide whether or not to have kids. Now, nowadays, we look at that and go, like, really? That back then was revolutionary because we didn't have that choice before. It was not available to us in the same way. And of course, birth, reliable birth control was just coming out. And it was becoming an issue. So that program was, was a very interesting program that helped facilitate that whole decision-making process, which is interesting because, of course, I went on to do a lot of work around decision-making. And with my doctoral research, <laughs> interestingly, the fellow, one of the docs who came into this program to talk to the women in the, in the program, there were 20 women, um, was a little fiery Irishman from the fertility clinic. And he answered the women's questions about fertility and delayed childbearing and all of those things. And then when he left, he said, if you ever want to do something really useful, that's Pat, um, come to the fertility clinic. There are people who are suffering because they can't have kids. And nobody is acknowledging this. I ended up doing my internship with him at that center and doing my research my doctoral research in that area. Um, in terms of methodologies, back then it was quantitative, so my MSc, my PhD, um, the Fertility Awareness Survey, quantitative methods. did a mixed methods study, which uh, was a three-year longitudinal study supported by Health Canada, looking at the adaptation of biological childlessness for fertile couples. It was a three-year study, so we could standardize measures, but I also went out and interviewed people and spent and did in-depth interviews with several couples um, I love qualitative methods. I actually think that I probably would have stayed in academia had it not been for the fact that qualitative methods became more acceptable. And that's because as a clinician, um, so much of what I am able to uncover using qualitative methods becomes more applicable to clinical practice. So I'm grateful for that. I, I personally uh, do a lot of work using phenomenology, some narrative. Um, moving on. Because of this kind of interdisciplinarity in terms of my work, I tend to put my empirical uh, findings in places like fertility and sterility and human reproduction into the two top medical journals of repro in, uh, reproductive endocrinology. But there's a wide audience of people very specific, including mental health professionals who um, would read those journals. Psychology of Women Quarterly, uh, Journal of Youth and Adolescence, Canadian Psychology. In terms of the more clinical, and whenever I'm doing my research, I think, where do I want these findings to go? Where, where will they be most useful? So professional journals, women in therapy, I've published it many times, Journal of Counseling and Development. And again, I look at it and I say, OK, they've got a readership of 55,000 professionals. 
there's a way to get the word out about this kind of uh, work. Journal of Family Issues. Uh, my books have been with Guilford, New Harbinger. The Guilford, of course, is academic. New Harbinger was the first self-help book that I wrote. Uh, funding sources, Health and Welfare Canada, HSS, Michael Smith, SHRP, CIHR, Catalyst of Knowledge Translations. Now we move on to the current research interest. So that's kind of the history. Um, my current research is, I'm very interested in labor childbearing. I sat across from way, way, way too many women, uh, lesbian couples, uh, heterosexual couples, where they came in saying, I'm 42, and I thought I would meet the partner that I could parent with and never did, and I don't want to not have children. Uh, I'm now ready. Uh, I had couples where they say I'm in the best shape I've ever been in in my life, and I had to say to them, you might be in great shape at 42, but you have 42 year old eggs. They didn't know that. The lack of information was absolutely astounding sitting on the other side. It was heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Um, so, when I stopped doing clinical consulting, this whole issue became really important. It seemed to me that we needed to be working on the other end. Rather than seeing people who were ending up childless by default, um, often career women, not always, um, it seemed like we needed to be doing more education. So, let me tell you a little bit about later childbearing, because it's fascinating. There's been a tenfold increase over the last 30 years in the number of women delaying childbearing until their mid-30s and beyond, which is amazing. In Canada, in 2007, more babies were born to women aged 30 to 34 than any other age group. Age 30 is now the average age of first birth for Canadian women, which is astounding. When I started doing this work years ago, if you hadn't had your first child at the time you were 30, they were seriously concerned. They had horrible terminology that they would use to describe women who hadn't had kids by the time they were 30. Um, old maid being one of them. The numbers of births for Canadian women over 39 is more than tripled in the last decade. More than tripled. In 2005, this really is an international phenomenon. It's not just Canada, it is North America, it's all around sort of the developed world. In 2005, there were more than 104,000 births in the U.S. to women aged 40 through 44, and over 6,500 to women 45 and older. That's a lot. Uh, and that's first births. In the U.K., between 92 and 2012, 300% increase in the number of women and a 149% increase in the number of men having children in their 40s and beyond. Like, this is a huge phenomenon. We're pushing the fertility envelope, just a bit here. Crown design for the older one. <laughs> but is it really that extreme? No. This woman was a, is now 69. This woman is the Romanian woman who had multiple, multiple IVFs from multiple clinics around the world. And eventually, through IVF, donor egg, donor sperm, she was a single woman, ended up having, getting pregnant with twins. The other little girl died in utero. This one was born when she was um, 66. And she's now three years old, and I have to tell you that, does she look like somebody else? She looks like a grandma. And she wants to have another child, apparently. Then we have another woman, just as examples. This was the woman from Spain. Um, and this particular woman lied to the fertility clinic in California, used donor sperm and donor eggs, mortgaged her house back in Spain, ended up with these two little boys, um, believed that because her mother lived well into her 90s that she would be long lived, and she died two years later from cancer. And those little boys are now being raised by, I believe, her nephew. Then we have one of the oldest women, and this, this is really, this is the cultural piece, it's really interesting. In India, the number of women in their 60s and 70s trying to have children is astronomically high, because for many, there were no options before, and being childless means you have no status. I once worked with an East Indian woman at, at the Genesis Fertility Center. This woman was an astrophysicist. She was brilliant. She was so accomplished. She was working on her fourth or fifth IVF, and she said to me, if I am not a mother, I am nothing. I am nothing. My husband will take another wife. He has every right to take another wife. Um, amazing pressures. Anyways, this particular Raja Devi, Devi, uh, was 69 when she had this little girl. 
She now has cancer as well and is dying. Her sister is married to the same husband that she is married to. Her sister is 10 years younger and is hoping to go through IVF as well to have a sibling for this child. Um, there in India, there are, it's, it's a bit like Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale. There are clinics that Europe, Eastern Europeans, Europeans, Americans go to and basically they rent a womb. These very, very poor women who have no other way to make money for their families go into these supposedly luxury places where they are inseminated with the sperm of the male partner. They give birth um, to a child or children that they then give to the awaiting parents and then they go back to the villages. Um, often with, if I remember the stats of money, um, it would cost a couple about $30,000. The woman herself would get two or 3000 for this after however many months gestating and giving birth to this child. Complex reasons for delaying, career establishment and progress, educational attainment, things are taking longer. Uh, that is one of the real realities. Economics and affordability, uh, we were talking, or Dean Frank was talking daycare. The average single woman who hasn't had a partner and who wants to have kids in her 30s, can she afford to stop work? Can she afford the $1,600 a month for daycare? I mean, it's incredibly difficult. The most common reason for women delaying is lack of a suitable partner. People like to think it's career and you know she wants to have it all. And for many, it's lack of a suitable partner. Um, there's also the belief that there's time when people are ready and they just do IVF. And there's lots of mis and misinformation, like the Hollywood baby boom. Uh, people don't realize that the celebrity moms are using the eggs of a 21-year-old or a 22-year-old to have children. So they see these beautifully fit, model-ish 48-year-olds, and they say, oh, no problem. Look at her. She can do it. I can do it. I'm fit. I'm healthy. So if you look at the and they also don't understand. If you look at Celine Dion as an example, our good Canadian icon, those twins that she had at 43, six IVF attempts. Now in the States, one IVF attempt would cost about $20,000. How many people can afford six IVF attempts? Much less, what are you doing in your body? Uh, so they see the outcome. They see the end product and say, ha, huh, but they don't understand the other pieces. They don't understand, for example, that Jane Seymour almost died of preeclampsia giving birth to those twins. Um, mm -hmm. they, just, they don't get it. So There's also people in, in, in this. I'm sorry for interrupting, no, but in Simon, Simon, Dion, Simon Dion's case, so those were her eggs? We don't know. Oh, you don't know? Okay. They don't tell us. I was just wondering, I mean, uh, just, just, so she's making her womb in a sense. <laughs> they, would I mean, use, they would use the sperm of her partner. Okay. Uh, you know, the child would not be genetically hers, it would be gestationally hers. And we get into this, you know, gestational, genetic, uh, you know. I have this wonderful cartoon that I should have put in, where this kid is saying it was a lot easier when, when we, they told her to get from the cabbage patch. You know, gestational. <laughs> <laughs> genetic ones. And in fact, we now have something uh, that a lot of lesbian couples are doing, which is called reciprocal IVF. And that's because the laws haven't caught up to technology. So you have a lesbian couple who want to have a child. They go through IVF. They take the eggs from the one partner. They then use donor sperm. They take the eggs. They create embryos. The embryos go back into the womb of the other partner. So one is genetically connected. The other is gestationally connected. Amazing. Then we have all of this. Um, Promoting hope. We've got websites, we've got books, uh, affordable fertility treatments, we've got reproductive tourism becoming incredibly popular. If, for example, this happened in Alberta, and it gets very interesting in terms of healthcare, 52 year old, um, I believe she's an East Indian woman, tried to have a, a child of her own, went through several failed IVFs. They finally cut her off at 50, which many clinics will do, and say, no, you can't do this anymore. It's, not, it's just not going to work. She went to India, used over eggs, came back with twins. Like many twins, particularly when you're 52 years old, those babes were born early. They did not have the facilities, the hospitals in Calgary to deal with these babes. She had to be medevaced to Montana. Huge, huge bills. And people are saying, wait a minute. 
We said no, based on best practice, so people can go out of the country, come back in, and yeah. we're responsible. Now, I'm not going to get into the ethical debates about that, but these things happen. They now have a fertility show once a year in London, England, where all of these various docs and clinics and medical specialists and drug companies promote their wares. Selling hope. Consequences of delaying more maternal, fetal, and infant health risks, more infertility and unintended childlessness, increasing reliance on AHR, assisted human reproduction. In 1982, when I started doing this work, there were five fertility clinics in the U.S. There are now well over a thousand, well over a thousand. And while Canada is 32, and we are really conservative, the States is the wild west of fertility treatments. You can get anything you want if you look hard enough, and if you're willing to go to docs that aren't necessarily part of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And it's amazing how many people say, I'd never do that, I'd never do that, because they believe it's going to happen for them, and when it doesn't, they end up pursuing these things that they never thought in a million years that they would pursue. Uh, more pregnancy terminations. This is an interesting one. This data is just coming out now. Because there are more fetal abnormalities as women age, and because people tend to do more prenatal testing, there's far more pregnancy terminations happening, particularly for women over 40, because when they find out the baby's Down syndrome or whatever, they terminate, or they don't, depending. And the reproductive tourism is now a big issue. So, I decided that we needed, well, I sat on the other side of people saying, they don't have the information they need. We needed some data. What do they know? What don't they know? So I applied for a Catalyst grant back in 2010. They did something called the Fertility Awareness Survey. Did it online. Uh, that one was in English and French. And eventually, with a little money that was left in the grant, we actually made a few adaptations to it and did the survey with men, Canadian. Um, basically, we were looking at people's fertility and childbearing intentions, their beliefs and knowledge about later childbearing and assisted reproductive technologies, and their current and preferred sources of fertility information. They had to be currently childless adults, 20 to 50 years of age. They had to presume that they were fertile. In other words, they hadn't been diagnosed previously as infertile, and that they might consider pursuing pregnancy in the future. People in their 40s might consider pursuing pregnancy in the future. We recruited at the Montreal Women's Show. That was a complete bomb. I've never been to one of those shows before. If you don't give them things, whether it's candy or something else, they don't come. Very interesting. <laughs> Email list service and blogs, recruitment notices, word of mouth, chatelaine.com advertisement. We tried everything. Um, we finally ended up going also to a survey company, and we know that there were implications of that. We ended up for the women with um, a total of 3,345. Um, 2,000 came through the survey company, and 1,345 came on their own for word of mouth. The male sample, we had a little bit of money left, so we decided to use the survey company again and target and try and match the two samples as well as possible. We ended up with 599. We had the same inclusion criteria, and nobody has looked at men and their knowledge before. This is just completely new. In terms of demographics, um, it's pretty interesting. For the women, there are a lot between 20 and 29. Um, it's pretty well spread out. The only difference here, and this of course is a biological difference as well, because men can wait longer, we ended up with a fair number of men, 28%, who were between 40 and 50. A small part of our sample uh, was between 40 and 50 in terms of women. Pretty much heterosexual. Um, most of the women, about 65%, had a current partner. Not so for the men, which might explain why they were still assuming they might have children in the future. Uh, and they were primarily uh, identified as white Caucasian. Interestingly enough, pretty well-educated sample overall. Uh, we crossed right from high school through postgraduate. Uh, I think this figure for women had a lot to do with the fact that the samples that were, that were self-selected, a lot of them were through university listservs. Um, so I suspect that that might be why we had a higher number. Gross household, household income, again, right across the board, uh, pretty well distributed. Um, 
ended up quickly because there's lots to talk about. Employment, most were full-time employed, some were part-time, some were students, some were on disability, um, would have had resources. In terms of their fertility intentions, just to give you some of the findings, which are the more interesting thing. Most people were expecting or wanted to have two kids. It's always been the case. Pretty much the norm. And you would have thought that that had changed. Not, not so. So the majority wanted to have two. Some wanted to have one. Um, and there was an interesting, almost equal number of men and women who wanted big families. Their expected age at first birth um, not their ideal age, because their ideal age was significantly lower. Their expected age, most women expected uh, to have children between 21 and 30, um, but that was not the case for men, and this is where there's the most significant difference. And again, biological realities. Many men don't have their children until they're in their 40s because they end up with women who are younger than them. Um, another interesting stat I'll talk about another time. Expected number of months. This is interesting. Expected number of months it would take for them to conceive. The majority of people actually believed, irrespective of age, that it would only take six months for them to conceive, which actually is completely not true, um, and particularly for women who are over 35. Uh, but there is that expectation. At most, you know, a year. The actual definition of infertility is a year of unprotected intercourse. Uh, regular unprotected intercourse for people under 35. For women over 35, it's six months of unprotected intercourse and then they're considered infertile. Um, that's the definition. Based on the fact that fertility declines dramatically with age. How would they feel if they, might, if they weren't able to have children? You'll see that um, men disappointed. Women upset or distraught. So, despite the fact that they hadn't had kids yet and were delaying, this was an important thing for many of them. And interesting, even for men, important. There were only a small percentage of men who said they wouldn't be bothered. And frankly, you're not bothered until you can't do it. Right. And you end up a whole lot more bothered. Fertility knowledge. We had two self-ratings. Uh, women, when we first put the scale together, there were 16 knowledge questions. When we decided to, to do the thing with men, we used the same 16 knowledge questions, but we added four more that were very specific to male fertility. So there were 20 knowledge questions for the men. Most of them, interestingly enough, when it came to general fertility knowledge, most of them felt they had some knowledge or were fairly knowledgeable. Not many said they had no knowledge, both men and women. When it came to assisted human reproduction, um, again, a fair number said they had some knowledge. Uh, but you'll see men, really, say, and women, said they, a fair number said they had no knowledge at all. Which is really interesting because many of them are relying on reproductive technologies to help them down the road, as it turns out. And we had some who thought they were very knowledgeable, or maybe they were. So, they had to indicate, in terms of knowledge questions, they definitely didn't believe in the pro that the, the question, definitely not, probably not, they were uncertain, or definitely and probably. And we basically looked at these and said, no, don't know. Those two are part of the same. And yes, when we were basically getting rough calculations of knowledge. So what at least 50% of women and men actually know? They know that fertility declines with age, which is interesting. They know that the rates of miscarriage are significantly higher for women in their 40s. They know, and I think this is relative to me, because you can see women just, just starting to understand this. Men, yeah, right on the borderline. Egg freezing before the age of 35 can significantly prolong the woman's fertility. So, fair enough. They know that sexually transmitted diseases significantly increase the risk of later fertility, and they've got some very basic, basic information. They know that most couples have to go through IVF, or women know, men not so much, have to go through IVF more than once to have a baby, and Women know, men not so much, that a woman's weight affects her chances of conceiving, which it does, and that's too much weight or not enough. So what didn't they know? They didn't know that for women over 30, overall health and fitness is not a better indicator of a, uh, fertility and age. This is a huge misconception. Only 20%, 27% of women and 19% of men knew that. 
but most did not. Uh, they, they believed that taking birth control pills for more than five years would actually negatively affect a woman's fertility, and it does not. This is really fascinating. Um, only 49% of women and 34% of men made the women's age result issues, which is, of course, the primary reason for age related fertility declines. They didn't know that prior to menopause, the assisted reproductive technologies cannot help us women to have babies in their own age. And in fact, ma the majority, only 9% of women knew that, 8% of men. The majority, the overwhelming majority, believed that IVF could help a woman have a baby using her own eggs up until the age of menopause, which is on average 51. So again, if you think back to the movie stars, and they're not talking about the fact that these women are using someone else's eggs, they just don't know. Uh, fertility clinics will provide treatment to women over the age of 45. They didn't know that. They thought that there was a cutoff, which would explain that there's a real push for people by the time they're 40 to come into clinics. Um, they, they didn't know, it's almost borderline, that the age of male partner is an important factor in a woman's chances of becoming pregnant. And in fact, it's 50-50 in terms of fertility problems. And, and in fact, it's about 33% male factor, about 33% female factor, and then there's a combined factor between the two. Uh, they didn't know that IVF poses health risks for a woman, or that children can see through IVF and ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. That's when you get male factor infertility, they actually take one or two viable sperm, they poke a hole in the egg, and they guide that little guy in there, hoping that it eventually turns into a child. Now, there's huge debates about that, because, of course, you think about millions of sperm in one egg, and it's supposed to be survival of the fittest. This is not survival of the fittest. This is we pick the one that looks like it's still moving. Um, and away we go. And we're just now getting data on this, saying, yeah, there are, there are more problems with kids conceived through ICSI, which intuitively makes a lot of sense. Um, they didn't know that a majority of fertility conditions are not caused by problems with one's fertility, but of course, that makes sense, because women are so much more connected to our fertility on a monthly basis than men aren't, and there is an assumption that this is a woman's issue, and it is not. For the men, these are the additional questions. The upper age for a man to be treated at most Canadian fertility clinics is not 55. Most men thought by 55, that was it. I have worked with men who are coming in on oxygen tanks with their brides from the Philippines who are 33. And they're saying, I don't care. She wants this kid. Let's right. just do it. <laughs> no, that is not And I think this, is, this actually has real implications because when you hear about the age of the moms, everyone goes, oh my God, but what about the age of the dads? Um, they didn't know there's a significant decline in the quality of a man's sperm before the age of 50. They did know that smoking cigarettes and marijuana can reduce sperm quality, and they didn't know that children born to fathers 45 years of age and older have higher rates of learning disabilities, autism, schizophrenia, and some forms of cancer. They did not know that. So the old chip off the old block? Not so much. Conclusions, the respondents assess themselves as being far more knowledgeable about fertility and age rather than they actually were. Their level of knowledge was not highly correlated with their education, their age, income, uh, which was also surprising. Um, we looked at, at the, the, um, uh, the, all of the items on the two scales, and basically it was interesting because knowing one item did not correlate with knowing more than one item. Like, there was just no coherent body of knowledge. There were a lot of definitely... Um, a low percentage of definitely and, and absolutely, and a lot of uncertainty. So people just didn't know. They didn't know. So clearly there's a need for education. But every educational effort in this area has failed resoundingly. Uh, because American Fertility Society, you see the baby bottle upside down, time running out. This is a scary thing for people. And these have been scare tactics, which by and large, women look at them and go, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not in a position to be able to do this. And I've had people who, who come to my website and go, this stuff really scares me. And it is scary because if you're in a position where you want kids, you, you don't have a partner, you don't have the economic resources, what the heck do you do if time's running out? So we asked them where they would like to get their information from physicians, nurses, healthcare providers, but they tend to get it currently from the internet, magazines, and 
friends. And frankly, that's, that's probably a reflection of the fact that a lot of doctors, and I've worked with a number of women who've come in at 40 or 42, who said, I have been telling my GP since I was 32 that I want to do this. And he or she has said, don't worry, you've got plenty of time. You've got plenty of time. So even physicians don't know. So on the basis of that, I applied for a knowledge translation grant to create a website to help women decide, to, to, to facilitate men and women to facilitate informed decision making. And I'm going to, if I knew how much work there was to an interactive website, I would never have done this. <coughs> However, we created My Fertility Choices, and you'll see that we, we have information, fertility information. Uh, we worked very hard to make this user-friendly, warm, not scary, just basic information. This is what it is, this is where you get it. We talk about readiness, and you'll see these up top as well. Uh, decision making, and this is one of the only sites where we not only do, do we give accurate current information, but we also talk about how to make this decision. And how do you know if you're ready? And how do you communicate with your partner or with other people? Say you are a single woman who chose to use a sperm donor. <coughs> how do you answer people's questions when they say, who's the daddy? Uh, and what do they have a right to know? So it's, an, it's, a, it's been an interesting exercise. We also have weekly, we post new fertility news. We have docs, mental health professionals, and medical professionals who answer people's questions. We have personal stories that people post. And just facts. Did you know about this? Did you know about that? Well, let's see if I can get out of here. Our stats, we went live mid-June last year. We've had over 150,000 pages viewed by visitors from 170 countries already, which is amazing. Clearly, there's a lack of information. Uh, primarily, with US and Canada, UK next, India, Philippines, Australia, Singapore, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, we're looking at posting videos, expanding the site, newsletters, number of different things. Uh, recently, uh, the Infertility Awareness Association of Canada did a press release recently on the site because they're trying to promote more awareness around fertility. Um, the press release was picked up by 14 different outlets and they talk about media impressions. Typically these, these campaigns, they get about two, 2 million media impressions, we've had over 11 million. This is such an important topic and people don't know where to get the information. Needed changes. We need financial support for infertile women and men, removing the barriers for treatment. What are media impressions? It's um, when the, the audience that's reached, as well as people who are tweeting, people who are Facebooking, all of that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not a PR person, but this is what they explained to me when I said, what do you mean media impressions? Um, removal of structural and social barriers to viable childbearing. Women can't afford to do this. And interestingly enough, the tenure clock at the university is a prime example. The tenure clock runs parallel to the biological clock. We did a study a few years ago on mothers, pre, and they were not just pre-tenured, but mothers of children under the age of 13, academic women, talk about juggling. You know, daycare closes here at 6 o'clock. What do you do when you have to teach a night class? What do you do when you've already had to relocate? You have no family here. It's just difficult. Physician education, docs don't know what they need to know. These are the, the participants in the study suggested guaranteeing women free, available, quality child care as soon as and as for as long as they want and need it so that remaining on the sidelines of the workforce due to childbearing is not a disincentive to get them pregnant. Educating men that reproduction is their responsibility too and they should consider it when making their life choices. And one of our 33-year-old participants, and I will conclude with her, I believe that my cohort may have grown up in a climate in which many, many social barriers have been removed 
and our expectations of equality and opportunity are better than ever before. We have been raised to expect to not have to choose between family and career, but societal and government policy and most workplace structures, including UBC, a little ad lib there, have not kept pace with this progression. 